Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the Diane Downs case. So just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. So first I'll take a look at the background of Diane Downs, then take a look at the timeline of the crimes, the investigation, the trial, and then the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the background, Elizabeth Diane Fredrickson Downs was born on August 7, 1955 in Phoenix, Arizona. She would drop her first name, Elizabeth, when she was 14, so she just went by Diane. At that same age, she started a relationship with Stephen Downs, a 16-year-old boy who lived across the street. That couple stayed together. After high school, Stephen joined the Navy, and Diane went to Bible college, but she was later expelled for promiscuity. Diane and Stephen were married in 1973, and they had a rocky relationship. They argued frequently about Diane's infidelity. In 1974, the couple had their first child, Christy. Their second child, Cheryl, was born in 1975. The couple moved to Mesa, Arizona in 1978. Diane was having multiple affairs with co-workers and became pregnant. She had a son, Danny, in 1979. Stephen decided to raise Danny as his own, even though he was not the father. The couple got divorced in 1980. This isn't really that surprising based on what happened in this relationship. At this point, Diane dated a number of men. Many of them were married, and she attempted to reconcile with Stephen. She attempted to become a surrogate mother at one point. We see the process required a mental health assessment. The mental health professionals determined that Diane was psychotic although highly intelligent. 1981, Diane starts working full-time for the post office. Then, toward the end of 1981, she was accepted into the surrogate program. So I guess the whole psychotic thing really didn't scare them as much as one would think. She functioned as a surrogate and carried the child to term. She was paid $10,000. Excited by the whole process, she decided to start her own surrogate clinic, but this enterprise failed shortly after she started it. Around the same time, Diane met a man named Robert Knickerbocker. He went by the name Nick. They started having a romantic relationship, however, Nick was already married. Nick became scared of how needy and demanding Diane was, so he broke off the relationship. Diane moved to Oregon, but it was not over Nick. The two of them stayed in contact, and Diane visited Nick in April of 1983. During this visit, Nick rejected Diane once and for all indicating that he had no interest in serving as a father to her children. And this brings us to the crime. So here I'll start the timeline of the crime. May 19, 1983. 27-year-old Diane Downs drives to a hospital in Springfield, Oregon. Diane and all three of her children had been shot with a 22 caliber firearm. Cheryl was dead. Christy had a stroke. And Danny was paralyzed. Diane explained that she was driving and she saw a man on the side of the road flagging her down. She believed the man was in need of assistance. She pulled over and the man attempted to steal her car. When she resisted, the shooting started. She, of course, did not know who the man was. She identified him as a bushy-haired stranger. Nursing notes indicated Diane was in shock and unable to understand what was going on. She was shot in the arm. Her injuries were actually quite severe. The surgeons used a steel plate to repair her arm. In the days that followed, as medical professionals were treating Christy and Danny, we see that some of the hospital staff described Diane as cold, uncaring, and unemotional. They said she was having no emotional reaction. She didn't shed one tear. Diane had stated apparently that this incident, the shooting, had spoiled her vacation. She indicated that it ruined her new car. She got blood all over the back of the car. She told a physician that she knew Christy was brain dead and she wanted him to pull the plug. This physician, a surgeon, had asked a judge to appoint him and another physician as Christie's guardians. The judge granted his request. Now we move to the investigation. Due to Diane's unusual behavior, the police focused on her right away as the primary suspect. As we see so often, the investigators made a number of mistakes, including failing to look for fingerprints on Diane's car and failing to take any photographs of the crime scene. They indicated that the search for the bushy-haired stranger was not a priority. We see the police actually ignored many leads. They would later admit 
that they concluded Diane was guilty early on, and they stopped following leads just three weeks after the shooting. The police did not like Diane's attitude. They didn't think she was acting like a grieving mother should act. They believed she was laughing at the wrong times, like inappropriately laughing, that she sought attention, and that she smirked at them. In terms of actual evidence, rather than what the investigator's opinion was of appropriate versus inappropriate emotional expression, we see that Diane did change her story several times. In one story, the bushy-haired stranger knew her name, and another version had her answering a call and then driving out to meet someone. So this was problematic for her. Nine months later, on February 28, 1994, Diane would be charged with murder, two counts of attempted murder, and assault. Now moving to the trial, before I get into the evidence in this case, it's important to note here that Diane attempted to retain a famous defense attorney, Melvin Belli. This was the same attorney who was contacted by the Zodiac Killer, although he was already famous prior to that incident. Belli filed a motion for a three-week extension so he could get up to speed on the case, but the judge denied this motion, telling Diane to use the attorney she already had. So if Melvin Belli had been the defense attorney in this case, it is reasonable to believe there would have been a different outcome. Now, a lot of evidence was presented here. I'll first look at the evidence pointing toward Diane being guilty, and then look at the evidence pointing toward not guilty. So on the side of guilty, as Diane was driving to the hospital, there was a motorist behind her. This witness said that Diane was driving slowly, although Diane's story was that she was driving quite fast. Diane had a cold demeanor. She laughed at the wrong times, all those things I talked about before. Christie's pulse would go up when Diane would come into the hospital room, although this could have happened for a variety of reasons, like she could have been excited to see her. And this also happened on other occasions when other people visited Christie in the hospital. There was no blood spatter on the driver's side of the car, so this was inconsistent with Diane's story. There was no gunpowder residue on the driver's door, also inconsistent with the story. Not long after Diane arrived at the hospital, she called Robert Knickerbocker, right? So again, kind of looks like she had something else in mind. Why was she calling him when her kids had just been shot? Robert told the police that Diane was a stalker, right? So he didn't contribute anything that helped her. Diane's story was inconsistent, as I mentioned, and we see, I think, the most damaging evidence against Diane. Christy, her daughter, testified against her. Christy identified Diane as the shooter. Now moving to the evidence that points toward not guilty. We see the motorist that was driving behind Diane that I talked about who said Diane was not going quickly. This motorist also said that at no time did Diane do anything suspicious, like throw a gun out of the window. The police never recovered the murder weapon. They tried to argue that Diane had access to a 22 caliber Ruger semi-automatic pistol. However, when that gun was finally found in a drug raid in California, it did not match with the ballistics from the crime scene. Diane did not have any blood spatter or gunpowder residue on her hands, clothing, or hair, right? So it becomes difficult looking at that evidence to imagine how she could have been the shooter. She had no opportunity to clean her hands, her clothes, or her hair. And even if she did have time to try to get those out, that would be very difficult, right? Blood and gunpowder residue are hard to remove. According to the nursing notes, not long after the shooting, Danny asked one of the nurses, why did the mean man shoot me? This was ruled inadmissible, so the jury never got to hear that. Now, initially, Christy had repeatedly said that she did not know who shot her. Christy, of course, was separated from her family because of the judge's orders. She was interrogated repeatedly, and when she said she didn't know who the shooter was, the investigators would ask her to think again, and they would make suggestions to her. These interrogations were not recorded. It would be several months before Christy identified her mother as the shooter. The state hired a mental health professional to help Christy rebuild her memory, which strongly indicates they don't understand how memory actually functions. Years later, we see that Christy would say that she did not know who the shooter was. Christy's account of what happened in the car did not match the blood spatter. For example, she indicated that her sister, Cheryl, was sitting upright in the front seat when she was shot, yet no blood spatter was found in the front seat. Years after the trial, witnesses came forward saying that a man named James Haynes 
confessed that he was the shooter. Now, considering all this evidence, we see that the jury convicted Diane Downs on June 17, 1984. She was sentenced to life in prison plus 50 years. Prior to being sentenced, Diane gave birth to a girl she named Amy Elizabeth. The baby was taken by the state and given to adoptive parents. The girl was later renamed Rebecca Babcock. The prosecutor in the case adopted Christy and Danny, right? Some people view this as touching and appropriate, and other people look at this with a little bit more suspicion. Like, was this a conflict of interest? He was prosecuting their mother, right? So it's hard to know, but that happened either way. Now, we see that Diane escaped prison on July 11, 1987. She was found 10 days later hiding with a group of men. Five years was added to her sentence. It's also alleged that she had this escape attempt worked out with a boyfriend where he was going to hijack a helicopter and land it in the prison yard. It's not clear how serious Diane was about that escape plan, but it was something that, again, allegedly she had discussed. Diane was denied parole in 2008 and 2010, and she still maintains her innocence. So now moving to the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in a case like this. So we see in the closing arguments of the trial, the prosecutor said that Diane had been diagnosed as a deviant sociopath. Yet we see an affidavit from the mental health professional who assessed Diane, indicating that diagnosis was never given. The affidavit also correctly asserts that deviant sociopath is not a diagnostic category. So it doesn't exist in the DSM. Interestingly, on an MMPI that was administered to Diane, that's a Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory, Diane scored in the normal range for personality disorder. Diane was actually diagnosed with cyclothymia. Now, after Diane was convicted, the prosecution hired a mental health professional who, after interviewing Diane for an hour, diagnosed her with antisocial, narcissistic, and borderline personality disorders. Later on, we see opinions that suggest Diane does have an unusual style of emotional regulation, but this behavior falls short of what's required for a diagnosis of a personality disorder. So what's going on here? Well, of course, it's impossible to know for sure. All I can really do is align behaviors with different symptoms. Let's take a look at the disorders the mental health professionals diagnosed. So starting with antisocial personality disorder. What worries me about this disorder or the label sociopath is that in this case, the categorization is highly dependent on Diane being guilty. If she is guilty, then the mental health professionals might say, well, we see criminality, deceitfulness, impulsivity, aggression, a reckless disregard for safety, irresponsibility, and a lack of remorse, right? So with that crime, they can try to really touch on all the symptoms of antisocial personality disorder. But the problem here is that they are relying on one event, and all of these symptom criteria must represent a pattern. If she was innocent, what evidence remains indicating she could meet those criteria? Maybe they could argue that her inconsistent story lines up with deceitfulness, but either way, there's a much weaker case if she actually did not commit the crime. And I haven't seen any clear evidence that she had conduct disorder symptoms in her childhood either, but they, of course, would have had access to more information. Now, what about borderline personality disorder? Here again, they are relying on guilt. So they could say that this could bring in anger, impulsivity, and if her motive was getting her lover back, they could say, well, here we have frantic efforts to avoid abandonment. Without guilt, they could still make the argument that there is emotional instability and an unstable relationship pattern, but it seems like a leap to get to borderline personality disorder. So this brings me to narcissistic personality disorder. I find this to be a leap as well. Without guilt, they might be able to say that there was a need for excessive admiration, although I could argue that excessive really isn't established here. With guilt, they could argue a sense of entitlement, arrogance, manipulation, and a lack of empathy, but they would be running into the same problem they ran into with antisocial personality disorder. They're tying the symptoms to one event. I find it interesting that they didn't bring up histrionic personality disorder. I mean, they threw in every other cluster B personality disorder, so why not take a look at histrionic? With histrionic, we have a few symptoms that might align somewhat whether Diane was guilty or not. For example, trying to be the center of attention, being inappropriately seductive, 
We don't know if that was the case, but with the promiscuity, it makes it possible. Rapidly shifting and shallow expression of emotions, and we see believing that relationships would be more intimate than they really are. So there could be some alignment with those four symptoms. I think when it comes to personality disorders, I don't really see the evidence here that she clearly falls into one of the cluster B categories. We just need more information. I'm a little surprised that a mental health professional would diagnose her with three of the four cluster B personality disorders. It's certainly possible, but that is a relatively rare presentation. One of the most interesting diagnoses she received was the cyclothymia, officially known as cyclothymic disorder. This disorder involves subclinical hypomania and depression. So somebody has small highs and small lows. They never meet the full criteria for a manic or depressive episode. So if somebody has cyclothymic disorder, they could not have comorbid bipolar 1, bipolar 2, or major depressive disorder. We don't see this diagnosis too often. It doesn't explain the unusual emotional responses, but it would explain some of the impulsivity and erratic behavior associated with the crime. So the last question I'll look at here is, was Diane Downs innocent or guilty? So I'll look at this two ways, the legal perspective and reality. So with the legal perspective, we're talking about guilty versus not guilty, which is different than guilt and innocence. To be found not guilty, the jury only needs to believe there was a reasonable doubt. Now, the state's case, I think, was actually fairly weak. We have the absence of gunshot residue or blood spatter on the defendant, no murder weapon, the testimony of Christy, who was isolated from her family and bombarded with questions over the course of months. I really don't see the motive as compelling in this case. And of course, the investigators failed to follow up on a number of leads. I think that the state over relied on Diane's inappropriate reactions, as they called them, laughing at the wrong times, not seeming to be empathic, appearing to want attention. People tend to believe these behaviors are linked to criminality, but a strong case really can't be made here. The lack of empathy sometimes can be connected to criminality, but not reliably. Inappropriate laughing or wanting attention are not tied to criminality at all. As I've said before, looking at other cases, we see people have been through these extreme types of experiences, and yet these investigators think that they are mental health experts. They find meaning in these behaviors that simply is not there. We see the same thing here with that physician. He knew Diane was guilty within 30 minutes. It's amazing that he could know something that even trained mental health professionals would not be able to know. Now, these individuals were overconfident in their ability to understand what is really indicated by behavior. This thinking error led the investigators down a path, and once they focused on Diane, no other suspect was going to be identified. So, again, I would say not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But what about reality? So just guilt versus innocence. Did she really do it? I think Diane did do it. The fact that she changed her story several times strongly points toward guilt. Now, I don't know if she was the actual shooter. It would seem more likely that she conspired with somebody, which would explain the missing gun and the lack of blood spatter and gunshot residue on her. I'm a little surprised that she has maintained innocence for all this time if she was in fact guilty. I think she would have a much better chance of parole if she accepted responsibility. Although with that escape attempt, she didn't really endear herself to the parole board. This is one of those cases that causes a loss of confidence, not only in the criminal justice system, but also in mental health diagnosing. Here, as we've seen many times before, the same person is seen by multiple professionals and everyone gives a different diagnosis. It's frustrating because it's just hard to get a sense of what's really going on. It causes people to wonder about the accuracy of mental health diagnosing and the integrity of some mental health professionals. I know whenever I talk about true crime cases, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.